This is the lecture for Entomans, Science and Values. Are value judgments always irrelevant to the justification of scientific claims? So the first topic we start with is, uh, as with, I think, the previous lecture, as we're going through these introductory topics, we're learning about philosophy. And one of the ways we're learning about philosophy is sort of what sorts of things does philosophy study or what is philosophy uh, made up of? And so in this article, we get another kind of philosophy. It's usually called philosophy of science. And I have philosophy of science and then in parentheses and epistemology because in this lecture, I'm going to talk a lot about epistemology. So we're going to get introduced to two kinds of philosophy. So first, what is philosophy of science? It's kind of what it sounds like. So science is important, many people think. It's uh, one of the sort of great achievements of the modern world that we engage in science and learn about the world through science and come up with all sorts of amazing scientific discoveries and we know sort of all sorts of things thanks to the methods of science and thanks to the work of scientists and if you take a look at a university you'll notice that a lot of the departments at a university are science departments so they're either natural sciences departments like physics chemistry biology or their social science departments like uh, political science or economics or things like this. And so science takes up a lot of space in intellectual life, and it takes up a lot of space in philosophy in the sense that a lot of philosophers are very interested in science and what we can learn from science and what we can learn about science and how science works and why science works and whether science works and things like this. And so philosophy of science is basically just the label we give to all the parts of philosophy that are interested in studying science from various sorts of directions. The way this article studies science is it's asking uh, how science is related to value judgments. So that's one topic in philosophy of science. But there are many, many, many topics in philosophy of science. One of the possible topics that we're voting on, uh, scientific realism, that's one of the questions at the core of philosophy of science. So if you're interested in philosophy of science, that's one possible topic you might be interested in. So that's philosophy of science. This lecture, uh, topics number three through 10 in this lecture, or three through nine in this lecture, these are topics about epistemology. So what is epistemology? This comes from the Greek word um, epistem, which is uh, knowing or knowledge. No, exactly. Something, something about knowledge. And so epistemology is the study of knowledge and the study of knowing things. And so epistemology is another huge branch of philosophy. And basically, it's about how do we know anything? Do we know anything? Step one. Step two, if we know anything, how do we know it? What is the nature of this knowledge? Like, how do we, how do we come to have knowledge? What does it mean to have knowledge? Uh, what are the components of knowledge? What things relate to knowledge? And so I'd talk more about this, except that we're about to get quite a bit of epistemology from the rest of this lecture. So if you're interested interested in epistemology, uh, just keep listening. So that's topic number one. Topic number two, again, as we go through these initial uh, readings, one of the things we're looking at when we learn about how philosophy works is not just what topics does it study, but also, what methods are there in philosophy? How do you do philosophy? And in this paper, we get another sort of method, a method that philosophers of science use, which is, uh, you know, look at, look at what's up in science, sort of study what scientists do, and then draw conclusions from that. You get a very specific uh, example of this in this article. So as you read through this article, you'll notice Intamon is studying scientists and drawing conclusions about stuff, from what scientists do or how science works. So this is something that is not limited to philosophy. There are lots of fields that study science, sort of collectively they're united under uh, the sort of domain of science studies, or it's sometimes called science and technology studies or something like this. And the philosophy of science plays a big role in science studies uh, because the philosophy of science, one of the methods it uses is just looking at science and drawing conclusions. If you're interested in this, do we have a, well, um, I'm not sure this will come up again in the course. 
as a method of philosophy, but uh, we'll find out. I should I should plan that aspect of these lectures out a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, so studying science is one of the things that philosophers do. So now we're going to move into uh, sections three through nine of this lecture, and these are just a lot of sort of vocabulary words. So the best way to do this, the way I do this when this course is taught in person, is through group exercises and things like this. Uh, that's, that's very hard to do online. Number one, everybody has to show up. And number two, we need breakout rooms. And uh, Ashok is using the free version of Google Education, which they, they don't give us breakout rooms. They, that's only if you pay for Google Education fancy version. So uh, I could give you lots of worksheets and lots of assignments to do, but that's, I think, too much work. So I'm just, I'm just going to talk at you. Um, this is not the best way to learn, but <laughs> it, it is possible to learn uh, from this. There are other ways to learn about these um, vocabulary words. So I think the introduction book has some explanation of a lot of these. And then you can also find explanations of these in various places online. Don't just Google them. You can often find terrible stuff. But uh, if my lecture doesn't work for you, uh, just let me know and I can help you find more resources or we can talk about them. Uh, but the reason we're about to talk about all of these is that, number one, they show up in this article that we're reading, so it's good to have them for Intamon. But number two, and even more importantly, they show up all throughout philosophy. So these are going to, going to be important terms for the rest of the semester, not just in this Intamon article, because philosophers are all going to use these terms uh, to mean effectively the same sort of thing. So like we covered, for instance, argument in one of the first lectures where I said when a philosopher uses the word argument, this is what they mean. Uh, we're going to talk about what philosophers mean by belief and truth and so on. So starting with the first point, number three, fact versus opinion. So in common discussion, when people talk about fact versus opinion, uh, they talk about them as if they're opposed to each other. So somebody might say, oh, that's not fact, that's just your opinion, or, um, you know, facts are irrelevant, or your opinion is irrelevant to the facts or things like that, or your, the, the facts don't depend on your opinion. That's not really how we talk about things in philosophy. So in philosophy, a fact, what exactly is a fact? Well, that's, that's a huge topic in philosophy. We can talk quite a bit about it if you're interested. But just the basic idea is that a fact is sort of like a description of how the world is. And then sometimes we add it's like a correct description of how the world is. So if I say it's a fact that it's uh, 4 p.m. in India right now, that's a sort of, that's a description of what it's like in India right now. It's a description of the world. And again, often we restrict fact to true descriptions of the world. So if it's 4 p.m., then it is a fact that it's 4 p.m. If it's some other time, then it's not a fact that it's 4 p.m. in India. So a fact is a description of how the world is. So ideally, uh, pause the video right now and come up with a list of facts. Welcome back. If you pause the video, uh, oh, the thing is, there are billions and billions of facts because you can just describe the world as much as you want. So uh, it's a fact that I have a left hand. It's a fact that I have a right hand. It's a fact that my left hand has five fingers. It's a fact that my left hand has a pinky. It's a blah, blah, blah. So you can generate facts for the rest of your life and never run out of facts. There's lots and lots of facts. What is an opinion? An opinion is a belief. What is a belief? Well, now we move on to part uh, four of the lecture, belief. So what does it mean to say somebody has a belief? Uh, a belief is something that you think is true. Uh, a belief is perhaps a fact that you think is true. It's, so it's a description of the world that you think is true. So if I believe that I have a left hand, then I think it's true that I have a left hand. If I believe that I have a right hand, then I think it's true that I have a right hand. If I believe that um, it's Tuesday, then I think it's true that it's Tuesday. So a belief sort of describes what's going on inside my head. It's what I think about the world, or what I think about anything, really. It doesn't have to be the world. So a belief can maybe come in degrees. So maybe I'm 99.99% sure that I have a left hand. I don't know, maybe I could be in the matrix or something, but I'm pretty sure I have a left hand. Maybe I'm 70% sure it's Tuesday, 
you know, it's 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 in the winter break. I don't really know what day it is. I haven't really been keeping track, but I, I think it's pretty sure it's Tuesday. Maybe I'm 20% sure uh, that... Uh, I, can't, I can't think about something I'm 20% sure about. But So the thought is, uh, the, the more sure you are about something, the more you maybe believe it to be true. So I absolutely believe it to be true that I have a left hand. I sort of believe it's true that it, I mean, it's not Tuesday, but whatever, whatever. So belief can come in degrees. And remember, I said opinion just means belief. So if it's my opinion that I have a left hand, then it's my belief that I have a left hand. Uh, I have a, it's a correct opinion, but it's an opinion. It's a belief. So that's how philosophers think about opinions and beliefs. Ideally, pause the video right now and list some beliefs that you have, and then if you can, try to put like a level of certainty attached to the belief. Welcome back if you paused. If not, hey, shame on you. But uh, moving on. So justification. So a justification is a reason to have a belief. So what is my justification for thinking that I have a left hand? Well, I have lots of justifications. Number one, I can see it. Number two, I can feel it. Number three, I can sort of move it around and touch things with it. Number four, if I ask people, do I have a left hand, they'll say yes. Uh, number five, I've always had a left hand and I don't remember it getting cut off or anything. So I have lots of justifications for my belief. So justifications are attached to beliefs because they're reasons for having beliefs. So what can justify thinking that you have a left hand? All sorts of things. The more justification and the better justification you have for a belief, probably the more certain you are in a belief. But that's not always true. Sometimes the sort of the link between justification and belief kind of gets broken, maybe if we're not thinking clearly. So if you give me lots of evidence that, uh, you know, I'm wrong about something, I might not change my belief. I might not believe, you, I might not agree with your justification. Why? I don't know, maybe I'm stubborn, maybe I'm, I don't really listen to the evidence, things like that. But, you know, if I were a perfect person, maybe I would change my belief when I'm presented with justification for thinking something different. So, justification is related to belief. Justifications are reasons for having or for not having certain beliefs. So, uh, I should have made you write down the beliefs you came up with when you paused the video last, but, uh, Ideally, pause the video right now, come up with some beliefs, or use the beliefs you came up with already, and then come up with justifications for those beliefs. All right, welcome back. Uh, the next topic is truth. So truth, and sorry, I said this about fact, I should say this about all these terms. All of these terms are actually very complicated, like there's a lot of debate about what exactly these terms are, whether these descriptions of giving are exactly correct, and so if you're ever interested in any of this, this is all the domain of epistemology, and there's a lot to say about this, so we can talk a lot about this if you're interested. But, sorry, moving on. Truth. So what is truth? Usually uh, we talk about truth as sort of how the world is, like what actually is. So if this sounds similar, you might remember I said a fact is a description of how the world is, or maybe it's a true description or an accurate description of how the world is. And so then the truth is just sort of the thing the thing described by the facts, like what actually is, how the world actually is. So the fact is, like the facts are maybe like lists of truths or a list of possible truths. We usually try to have true beliefs. So when I believe that I have a left hand, I try to make sure that I actually, it's actually true that I have a left hand. Sometimes when we have a false belief, the belief does not line up with the truth. But, uh, you know, that's that's just life sometimes. The more justifications you have for a belief, the more likely it is that the belief describes a true thing rather than a false thing, and so on. So the truth is sort of how the world is. Moving on to number seven, knowledge. So in philosophy, this is like especially debated, but a good sort of starting point is knowledge is something like having a justified true belief. So what is a belief? It's how you think the world is. What is it for that belief to be justified? Well, you have good reasons for that belief. So it's not like the belief just popped into your head uh, one day out of nowhere or it came to you in a dream. No, you have good justifications for the belief. And it happens to be true. 
So a justified true belief is something that you know. It's knowledge in your head. So uh, ideally, pause the video and try to make a list of things that you know. All right, welcome back. So it's tricky to make a list of things that you know because in order to know something, you have to have a belief. So it's easy to come up with things you believe. You have to have justification. It's easy to come up with justification for things you believe. But it has to be true also. And how do you know if it's true? <laughs> like, you might be wrong. You've been wrong about things before. You will be wrong about things again. We've all been wrong about things. And if you knew you were wrong, you'd already have changed your belief. So really, to know if you have knowledge, you have to sort of, I don't know, you, to, well, how can you know? That, so that's a good question. That's one of the central topics in epistemology. So how can you know that you know anything? Where does that come from? But that's what philosophers, broadly speaking, are talking about when they talk about knowledge. Moving on, uh, number eight, testimony. So in normal English, testimony is like sort of when you when you're in a legal case or something and you're sort of talking in court about what happened. That's that's not how philosophers use the term. Philosophers use the term to talk about, uh, well, we use it in two ways. The most common way is testimony is information you're getting from other people. So if I tell you something, that's testimony. So you might say, well, I, like as opposed to what? So you can get information in other ways too. So you can get information by looking directly at the thing or learning directly about the thing. So let's say you want to know what color my water bottle is. Well, here's two ways to figure it out. The first way is you could get it via testimony. I could tell you my water bottle is red. So now you know via testimony that it's red. The other option is, look, here you go. You just look at it and you see that it's red. So there's different ways we can get information. Testimony is one of those ways. Now, I said there's two ways philosophers use the term. That's the more common way. Sometimes philosophers will talk about testimony, not just information coming from people, but information coming from like any sort of source, like the source is the is giving you testimony. So when I said, oh, look, you can just look at it, you could imagine, you could think of it as your eyes are giving you information. So you're sort of sitting there, you're your brain or something, or you're the soul or whatever. And then you get information from your eyes. Your eyes say, hey, we see a red thing over here. So maybe that's testimony too. That's a more uncommon way of talking in philosophy. Usually we restrict testimony to stuff coming from people, not stuff coming from your eyes or from your ears or from other sources. But just be aware that the term is used in both sorts of ways. In this article, let me, let me double check. Uh, yeah, so in this article, she's only using testimony in uh, the sense of coming from other people. Uh, yeah, I mean, might as well pause the video and sort of think of some instances of testimony. Welcome back. Uh, so you may have thought, I'm not a mind reader, but one salient example of testimony is all this stuff that I'm telling you right now, all this stuff about what all these words mean. This is all testimony. You don't have any other justification for it. It's just coming from my mouth into your head. So this is all testimony about what these words mean. Uh, number nine, trust. So uh, do you always believe testimony? No. So sometimes somebody tells you, hey, uh, you know, the assignment due date got changed and they're right. And sometimes they tell you the assignment due date got changed and they're wrong. You know, so some of your friends are on top of things and some of your friends are just like, they always mess things up. Some people are colorblind. They can't see certain colors or they can't discriminate certain colors. So if they tell you something is a certain color, eh, maybe they're wrong, you know, maybe they're screwing it up and so on. Some testimony is reliable. Some testimony is not reliable. And so, you know, you have decisions to make. Should you trust somebody's testimony? Every time somebody tells you something, you have to decide, am I going to believe them or am I not going to believe them? So when you trust somebody, you treat their testimony as reliable, or at least that's the sense of trust that's relevant to epistemology, and so that is relevant to this article, and generally for the philosophy that we're reading. So when you see trust in a sort of epistemological uh, context, this means treating testimony 
as reliable or treating testimony as true. So that's what trust means in this context, accepting somebody's testimony. Uh, and yeah, yeah, pause the video, try to think of some examples of that. Welcome back. Um, since I sort of primed you to think about this, maybe you're trusting me right now. Maybe you're taking my testimony as reliable. I hope so, because I'm right, um, but maybe not. So that's numbers three through nine in the lecture. That covers the epistemology stuff. Now we have two more topics to cover in the lecture. So the first is the idea of a value judgment and the fact value distinction. So this comes up in the article, and this has also come up before, although we didn't see it called this before. So you may recall in the Carroll lecture, we talked about normativity, and now it's coming back in the form of value judgment. So a value judgment is uh, judging something to be good or bad according to some sort of value, or better or worse according to some sort of value. And we have a word for this. Uh, we call this normative judgment. So uh, this is the word we saw in the Carroll lecture. So when you see Intamon talking about uh, you know, value judgments and things like this, value judgments are an example of normative judgments. What are normative judgments? Well, as I talked about in the Carroll lecture, they're judgments of things that are good or bad or better or worse. They're judgments about uh, how the world should be or ought to be or what's uh, things like that. So sometimes we'll contrast values with facts. So we have something called like the fact value distinction. So there's certain matters of fact and certain matters that are sort of matters of value. So that's, that's kind of like, like a bad way of thinking about it. So don't spend too much time thinking about the fact value distinction. But like the initial idea is that, oh, some things are just matters of fact. What is fact? Oh, we talked about this up in uh, section three of the lecture. It's uh, a description of how the world is. So some things are matters of fact. It's just the world is certain ways. And then some things are just values. They're the ways that we judge the world. So we say, oh, the world is that way and that's good, or the world is that way and that's bad. So again, don't spend too much time thinking about this distinction. A lot of philosophers think there is no distinction. It collapses, blah, blah, blah. But this, this, the sort of initial thought is that Oh, value judgments are one thing, and then judgments of fact, judgments about how the world actually is, not about whether it's good or bad or how it ought to be, are another thing. So that's the sort of that fact-value distinction, and that's the idea of value judgments. And then you'll notice sort of subset A, like I have normative slash evaluative versus descriptive slash positive. So when I introduce the idea of normative terms or normative ideas or normative stuff in the Carroll lecture, I contrasted it with descriptive stuff. So descriptive sort of describes the world and normative judges the world. You can link that to the fact-value distinction. So facts are just descriptions of the world. They just describe the world. Normative things are values. They judge the world. They say what's good or bad or how it ought to be and ought not to be. Another word for normative is evaluative. It sort of evaluates the world. It says it's good or bad or how it ought to be. Notice evaluative has value in there. So it's the sort of value part of the fact-value distinction. And finally, the last word, another word for descriptive, for describing the world, is positive. Um, I don't know why, where that comes from exactly, but the basic thought is like a positive description of the world is just a description of how things are. It's not about what's good or bad, whether those things are praiseworthy or blameworthy, or whether we should be happy or sad about them. It's just sort of a positive description of the world is one which is just stating things as they are. So positive is a synonym for descriptive. Evaluative is a synonym for normative. And these are all quite relevant because this article that we're reading is about the role of value judgments in science. And as I talked about a bit in the Carroll lecture, you might think, oh, science is just a positive slash descriptive enterprise. Scientists are just giving us lists of facts about the world. Their job is to tell us what the facts of the world are. It has nothing to do with values. It has nothing to do with normative judgments or evaluative judgments. It has nothing to do with telling us whether the world is good or bad, whether the world ought to be certain ways. So that's one description of what science is up to or one picture of how science works. And that's what this article is about, the link between science and values.
Finally, the last topic, underdetermination. So uh, this is this comes up in the article. So we're on the bottom of uh, page 507. And she says, most philosophers on both sides of this debate at the very least acknowledge the Duhem Quine thesis. Roughly, a theory being tested has no observational consequences taken by itself. Nothing can be taken as evidence for a hypothesis without assuming certain auxiliary hypotheses or background assumptions. Thus, I will assume that everyone will agree, blah, blah, blah. So this is the Duhem Quine thesis. It's probably very hard to understand what it is just from this uh, two sentence description. So it's not very important to know this. So if you want, you can just stop the video right now, and walk away. I'm going to explain this for two reasons. Number one, it comes up in the article, and it's a com per potentially confusing thing in the article. So to fully understand the article, you want to understand this, so I'll help you understand this. And number two, this is just an interesting idea on its own, sort of aside from the role it plays in the article. This is sort of one of the interesting ideas from philosophy of science and also from epistemology. The two overlap in this area. And so we're going to talk about it, uh, but it's complicated, so it'll take a while. So again, you can leave now if you like. So what is the Duhem Quine thesis? So uh, roughly a theory being tested has no observational consequences taken by itself. So uh, first let me drink. So let's take a very, very simple scientific theory just to uh, understand what's going on. So my scientific theory is uh, there is a cat that lives on the campus at Ashoka. So that's that's my scientific theory. How am I going to investigate my theory? Well, I have my hypothesis. A cat exists at Ashoka. Uh, she lives here. Now I want to test my hypothesis. How am I going to test it? Well, I think pretty straightforward way, go out and look for the cat. So um, I walk around and then I see the cat. And I'm like, great, I see the cat. So I've confirmed my theory, or at least I have very strong evidence for my theory. It might not confirm the theory because, you know, maybe this cat actually doesn't live at Ashoka. Maybe it hopped over the wall, it's here for a little while, and then it's going to leave. Or probably it walked through the gate. That's easier than hopping over the wall. So, but I have some pretty good evidence, right? So the Duhem Quine thesis says, actually, it's not that you have direct evidence for your theory that the cat lives, there's a cat that lives at Ashoka. Because the observation on its own is not enough. Nothing can be taken as evidence for a hypothesis without assuming certain auxiliary hypotheses or background assumptions. What background assumptions would those be? Well, I have to assume, number one, I was not hallucinating, right? If I was hallucinating, then I don't have any evidence that a cat lives at Ashoka because the only thing I saw was a hallucination, not a real cat. So number one, I have to assume that I wasn't hallucinating. Number two, I have to assume that I'm not living in the matrix and everything is a lie. Because if I'm living in the matrix, I didn't actually see a cat. It's just some sort of robot is convincing me I saw a cat. I have to assume I'm not dreaming. I have to assume uh, the cat was not some other animal in disguise. I have to assume all sorts of things. So the basic thought is that uh, this is called, oh, she actually, she doesn't call it. So the other name for this is underdetermination. So a scientific theory or evidence for a scientific theory doesn't sort of determine what we should say about the theory on its own. Rather, we have to add in a bunch of auxiliary hypotheses. So let's do this not with my weird silly cat theory, but with an actual scientific theory. So let's say I have a theory about uh, some virus. I think the virus has I don't, some... <laughs> I don't know a lot about viruses. I, uh, I look at the virus in a microscope and I say it's got these characteristics. So I make an observation and this confirms or disconfirms one of my hypotheses. The Duhem Quine underdetermination thesis says, no, not unless you assume that uh, the microscope was working correctly. And in order for the microscope to work correctly, what does this mean? 
Well, I have to assume all the laws of optics are correct. So the laws of optics describe how the lenses work and the focus and so on and so forth. I have to assume that I'm correctly understanding uh, what the microscope is presenting. I have to assume that nobody swapped my sample of the virus for something else. So the basic thought is that when I observe something about the virus and I confirm or disconfirm my hypothesis, I'm actually not just testing that hypothesis. I'm really testing that hypothesis plus all the other assumptions that I make. Because if I observe the virus has like, I don't know, some characteristic, and I, and I think I disconfirm a hypothesis, maybe my observation was of the virus, but maybe actually something was strange in the microscope. How do I know? So I have to make these assumptions in order for any of my uh, observations to work. That at least is the claim of the Du Quine thesis. So that's not super relevant to what we're going to talk about in this article. So great. Um, but if you're interested in that, this is a big topic in philosophy of science. So number one, is this thesis true? And number two, if it's true, what does it imply for science? It seems to make things much more complicated. We're never actually testing our theory on its own. We're always testing our theory plus a bunch of assumptions. Should we make these assumptions? What justifies them? And so on. So uh, if you find this interesting, Feel free to talk with me about it, or we can you can read up more about it uh, in various places.